In this tutorial, we're going to take another look at our WSDL. So I have the Sharp Info Service WSDL open because that's kind of like the simpler of the two. And um, look at this section for the operations. So you have two messages which are defined in the operation. So there is an input message and an output message. And this ties in with our uh, Java class here shop info and this is the method which is which corresponds to the operation so you have the input and you have the output right so think about this for a minute is there a possibility that the output might not happen we know that we need to provide an input for an operation or a method to get called but is there a possibility that the output message might not be returned now think about it in the Java world. Is it is it possible that this string might not be returned as a return type of this method? Well, it's possible when this method throws an exception, right? We haven't thought about that eventuality. So now what happens if during the execution of this method, there is an exception that's thrown and this line never gets executed. So in that case, a string is never returned as a part of this method and the output message is never constructed, right? There's no message to return as a part of the output. Instead, there is an exception. Now, what happens in that in that scenario? Well, we're gonna examine that in this tutorial by actually throwing an exception. Now, we notice here that the, the get sharp info takes in an input property, and depending on the property, it returns an output response. And if the property is not something that this method recognizes, right now, this method recognizes just two, right? It looks at the shop name, and since. If it's neither of the two, it just returns invalid property. Now what I wanna do for this method is, if the input property is neither of these two that I'm checking over here, I wanna actually throw an exception instead of just returning a string. So I'm gonna make that change by just making this as null. And uh, I'm gonna add an else block here if it's neither of these two, then I wanna throw a custom exception. So I'm gonna create a new exception of my own. So I'm gonna right click here, new Java class, and I'm gonna call this invalid input exception. And the super class is going to be Java Lang exception. Finish. So when I'm writing an exception class for a web service, for a SOAP web service, there are specific things that I will need to do. I'm just gonna walk you through the things that I'm doing here specifically for a web service exception, and then we'll see how that affects the response from the web service. So the first thing I'm gonna do is have a string, a private, string error details. So I wanna store information about the error as a string. And then I'm gonna have a constructor that takes in two arguments. One is a string reason, which is the reason for the error. And then the second argument is the error details. So I want uh, whoever throws this exception to be able to provide me with these two details, okay? One is the reason why the error happened, and then the second is information about the error itself. Now, the reason is something I'm gonna pass to the parent exception. This is, this is usual stuff, right? This is what you would normally do for an exception. The error details is something that's special over here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have this dot error details equals error details. So I'm gonna capture information about the error over here. And what I'm also gonna do is, I'm gonna have a method public get fault 
info. So I'm creating a specific method called get fault info in which I'm going to return this error details that I'm capturing. And this is my exception. So most of it should make sense except for this get fault info and uh, me returning the error details. And we'll understand that when we actually see the response in action. So I have created a custom exception now, right? Nothing too fancy, just except for this uh, method. It's pretty much, uh, you know, the run of the mill exception. So I'm going to use this exception now in my shop info. So I'm gonna throw this invalid input exception. Then the input property is not something that I recognize, okay? So I'm gonna say throw invalid input exception, and it has a constructor that takes two arguments, right? The reason as well as the error details. So the reason is gonna be invalid input. And the details about the error is gonna be, I'm gonna just print back the property that I've got and say, I don't understand this property, okay? So I'm gonna say property is not a valid input. Okay, so I'm going to, okay, forgot the new here. Now, since I'm throwing this exception, I need to add it to the declaration. So I need the method to say, this method throws an invalid input exception, okay? Now, if I save and publish this, I'm not doing anything else, right? I'm creating an exception and I'm throwing that exception in the method. And since Java requires it, I'm also declaring that this method throws this exception. And now I'm going to publish this. Now, if I open up the whistle, I'm gonna open this in a new tab so that we can see the difference one difference is fairly obvious. In the operations, there is a third message here. So this is the hidden message that I've been talking about. We haven't seen this so far, but we are seeing it now. And the reason for that is that we have declared this method throws this exception. So the visual that gets generated automatically knows that there is a possible fault that gets generated out of this operation and it actually declares it in the visual. So Fault is the web service terminology for exceptions. So if something goes wrong, you get a fault message, okay? So we have an input message which needs to be sent for the operation to execute. If the operation executes successfully, we have an output message that's declared over here. And if the operation fails and we get an invalid input exception, which is the exception that gets declared, we have a fault message, okay? So a couple of questions here. now. What happens if it throws multiple exceptions? Now this method could throw another exception, right? So in that case, there will be another fault message. So you can actually have multiple fault messages. So it's not uh, just two messages that an operation has. It could have multiple messages depending on the, uh, you know, the output as well as the exceptions. Now the fault message itself is referring to the invalid input exception type. So just like the input and the output messages refer to types. The fault message is also referring to this type. So let's take a look at this type. Now I'm gonna open up the schema location here again. And if you see here, there is an additional complex type called invalid input exception. And it has two elements, the fault info and the message, okay? so. Everything is pretty much the same. It works the same way as a standard output message. But the thing is, this is specifically for error scenarios. So the invalid input exception message is specifically thrown, uh, spe specifically returned when an invalid input exception is actually thrown in the code. So let's test this out. I'm going to use the tester for this. And uh, now if I have a valid input, you get a valid response. 
which is good. But now what if there's an invalid input? Now if I execute this method with this invalid input, what I get is an output that looks like this. So this is the SOAP response from the invalid execution. So what we have here is an element called s colon fault. So there is a fault element. As per the wisdom, we have a fault code, which is s colon server. We haven't done anything about this yet, but notice the fault string. The fault string says invalid input, which is the value that we have customized. And then the detail has invalid input exception. So this is the new type that was generated because of our exception class. And notice that it has, again, two values here. One is the message which says invalid input again, but the fault info is what we have set. We are echoing back the input that the user has entered, invalid, is not a valid input, right? So this is the message that we are printing. So this is, this is basically what the response is gonna be. But at this point of time, you're probably wondering why I haven't hit this button, right? Why I have not submitted this invalid input in the tester. The reason is if I submit this, notice what happens. We actually get an exception trace. We are not getting the message that I showed over here. So what's happening? Well, what's happening here is the Glassfish tester is actually showing us the exception trace instead of the fault message because it thinks that it's actually handier for us as we are Java developers to actually see this stack trace. But it's probably not a good idea to show the stack trace as a part of the SOAP response because you remember, a SOAP response has to be technology independent. And ideally, a SOAP response needs to have something like this. It needs to have the fault and it needs to have the fault message. So this is actually what the endpoint would provide. But what we see here as a stack trace is actually a limitation of the Glassfish tester. So how do we see this message then? How do we actually make sure the default message is actually getting displayed fine. For that, we're gonna use a couple of tools that I'm gonna explain in detail in the next tutorial. But uh, you know, assume that this is what's the value that gets generated. And uh, you know, we've seen how to get this kind of an exception from a custom exception class. Okay, so the get fault info is what's getting called by the framework to get the fault information that we have set over here. And that's what's getting displayed in the output. Okay, so we're getting the fault info over here. So in this tutorial, we looked at how to create a custom exception and how to throw that and get a fault uh, message as the output rather than the standard output message of invalid input, right? So we are having a custom exception gets converted to a, you know, a fault SOAP message. In the next tutorial, we're gonna explore some of the tools that let us see this kind of a SOAP message directly without having to go through the Glassfish tester. I am not sure if there's a way to turn this off and have the Glassfish tester show the you know the fault message, but I don't wanna bother with this right now because I'm gonna show you some tools which kind of give you SOAP messages directly so that we can actually see what's going on. Thanks for watching.